Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I want to tell you a little story about the L96A1, the Green Mini, arguably one of the coolest sniper rifles to have been produced in the last 50 years or so. Uh, this was adopted as the standard British sniper rifle in 1985, and when it was, it was a huge coup for Accuracy International. In fact, it's this is the event that turned Accuracy International into a thing, really. Prior to this, the British sniper competition, sniper rifle competition, AI was three guys essentially working out of a shed. Uh, two engineers and a competitive shooter. And to be blunt about it, they submitted their rifle to British trials basically because they wanted to get British testing and get a report back so that they could make their rifle better for the civilian market and the competitive market, which is what they were selling to and that's what they anticipated selling to. It came as really a pretty significant surprise to them when they actually won the competition. It turns out they had a fantastic rifle. The problem was they also didn't have a factory, they had a garage. And so they were awarded a contract to make a little over 1,200 rifles for the British Ministry of Defense. And they really didn't have any way to do it. They just didn't have the production capability for this. Like, they're in Dave's garage. They can't make 1,200 rifles in a reasonable time in Dave's garage. So. Uh, this sort of thing happens before. In fact, we see it a lot in World War II. Um, the M1 carbine is a good example. It's developed by Winchester, but it's manufactured by something like half a dozen different companies, all under license, because Winchester doesn't have sufficient manufacturing capability to produce as many of the M1 carbines as the government wants to buy. So same thing happens with the L96, to a much greater degree. Uh, Accuracy International has very little manufacturing capacity. Uh, and so the British MOD awards the contract for manufacturing the rifles to a company called Pylon Industries in Kent. Now this should have been a really good fit. Pylon was, uh, it was already certified as a, a military supplier and they were manufacturing uh, air-to-ground missiles, uh, anti-radiation, so like radar-seeking missiles. This is high-precision, high-tech stuff. It should be no problem at all for a company like this to manufacture some rifles, right? Especially bolt-action rifles. We're not even talking about self-loaders here. However, in a story that we see repeated a lot, well, certainly a lot more than you would expect in firearms history, this turns into a gigantic mess of problems. So first off, uh, the engineers at AI, the two Daves, are a bit young for their authority in, you know, in the industry, uh, especially compared to, say, the, the long-term career professionals who are working at Pylon who are rather older and don't take all that well to getting instruction from these, whoever these people are and their little three-person company, who obviously don't have the experience of a big manufacturer like Pylon who makes missiles. So, like, there are almost too many manufacturing problems that come out of Pylon to list them all. Uh, when it, it becomes clear that things aren't quite right, Pylon's not really communicating with the guys at Accuracy International, they're not collaborating for sure, and when the AI guys go over there to take a look at what's being made, Pylon rolls out their blueprints and it's immediately obvious that there's a huge problem because the blueprints are in metric. And what AI supplied was in Imperial measurements. So Pylon actually converted all of the blueprints for the rifle to metric, and they didn't do a very good job of it. They made mistakes in it. The tolerances, the, um, the, the allowances, the plus and minus allowances on the different measurements were not exactly the same in uh, metric as they were in Imperial. So that's the beginning of problems. Parts are not being actually made to spec because Pylon took it upon themselves to redraw the blueprints. Now you might think that's obviously a stupid one-off problem. Why would someone, why would they do that? Well the answer is all of Pylon's machine tools were set up for metric and so when they got these blueprints they just said oh well the way we are going to be able to manufacture this is to convert it, uh, or when they got their imperial blueprints we're just going to convert them to metric and then we can build the thing. It's a rifle, like how good does it have to be? You know it's not a missile or something. Uh, this did, in fact, lead to problems. There were further issues of Pylon making, not random changes, but making changes to the blueprints to make things more easily machined. And you can't just do that. And you'd think it's really obvious that you can't just change the blueprints and make something some other way and have it work, but 
people do all the time. And it's not even limited to machinery. You, know, you look at architecture, people do the same thing. The construction crews don't always actually do what the blueprints call for. Well, in this case, the truly catastrophic issue that came up that uh, was avoided only because Dave Walls of AI was super paranoid about this whole thing, because the rifle has his company's name on it. It doesn't say Pylon on it anywhere. Pylon's basically a subcontractor. Well, Pylon has the first 200 rifles ready to go to proofing. And so Dave Walls from AI shows up to inspect every single rifle before it actually goes to the proof house, because if something bad happens it's going to reflect way more badly on him than it will on Pylon. And what he discovers is almost an unfathomable problem to people who are familiar with how guns work. Pylon has taken the bolt lugs, like the locking lugs on the bolt, and instead of cutting them with a nice square faced back so they'll lock into a locking lug, or a locking recess, they've cut them at a 45 degree angle. And it, it, Dave Walls is almost unable to convince Pylon that this is going to be a catastrophic problem when the rifles get proofed. What he ends up doing is getting Pylon's directors in a boardroom, and he gets one of the rifles, and he gets essentially a cleaning rod, just a, a metal piece of metal round stock that'll fit down the bore. And he puts this, this rod down the bore with the bolt locked, and just pushes it, and the bolt unlocks itself and opens, because it's not, you don't have square surfaces against each other. You've got an angled surface sitting on a square one, and when you push on it, it just slides open. Uh, it's it really is almost inconceivable that a problem like this happens, and yet it did. Uh, it, <laughs> through, through this demonstration Walls was able to convince Pylon to make new bolts for these rifles, uh, but further investigation revealed that there were all sorts of other problems. Uh, the receivers were being cast. They're on the blueprints, they're supposed to be milled from a block of steel, but instead Pylon decided to cast them because it would save some money, and presumably they had some good casting infrastructure and they decided to use it. And there were other parts as well as the receivers that were being uh, cast instead of machined from bar stock. Uh, MOD finally came in at one point and looked at these problems and said, like, we can't be sure that there aren't casting flaws internally in these receivers. We don't know that they're actually going to survive, and it's not really cost effective to do enough inspection work to find out for sure. So MOD forced them to scrap the entire first 200 unit run of receivers and a bunch of other parts and rebuild the whole things. That finally kind of cleared the air between Pylon and AI a little bit. Pylon was a little more willing to accept help and advice and like obvious important direction from Accuracy International. Uh, after that whole fiasco, uh, but that wasn't the end of it. So this is all taking place late 85, early 1986. By the summer, late summer of 1986, rifles are finally coming off the production line, they're being supplied to MOD, and now for the first time a significant number of L96s are out in the field being used for practice, for competition, for you know general service use. These rifles initially went to the Special Air Service, the Special Boat Service, and the Royal Marines. Well, on a single day of range practice, fairly shortly after the rifles started actually arriving at units, they had multiple catastrophic failures. They had multiple out of battery detonations and unintentional firings. And it turned out what had happened, and this is the most, this is probably the most significant problem in L96 manufacture because it's the one that became public knowledge. These other issues would have been far worse, but they were caught in the manufacturing process. This is one that AI was unable to detect during manufacture at Pylon, um, and it got out into the wild, and it almost killed the L96 completely as a result. And the problem was Pylon decided to use a different steel for the firing pins than what was specified on the blueprints. Once again, you would think, you can't just do that. Like, that's not how manufacturing works, and yet in this case it was, and in a remarkable number of other cases the same thing happens. So in this case the firing pins were substantially weaker than they were supposed to be, and the way the AI rifle was originally designed, the back of the firing pin is completely shrouded, so there's no way for dirt or debris to get in. There's no cocking indicator, like there's no way to tell if it's cocked, but it's a bolt-action rifle, so essentially if you close the bolt it's cocked. Just treat it like that. Well the problem was 
it took very few cycles of cocking and uncocking the firing pin before they started snapping. And when they snapped, you would sometimes end up with the front section of the firing pin jammed into the bolt face and protruding out of the firing pin hole. And this led to two potential problems, both of which did in fact happen multiple times on the range for, in particular, one Royal Marine who was seriously injured as a result. Uh, the less catastrophic thing is the protruding firing pin fires the cartridge, it, like you're loading a cartridge and as soon as you get the, the bolt handle locked, it fires. And this, to the observer, the typical observer, looks like someone had their finger on the trigger and unintent, like negligently fired the rifle while they were operating the bolt. When in fact, it was actually the firing pin was jammed forward because it was broken, and it fired by itself when the bolt handle closed. That's the better option, because typically the rifles are pointed in a safe direction. By the way, this is why we have redundant rules of firearm safety. But the, the worst version of this problem was when you were chambering a cartridge and the protruding firing pin detonated the round as soon as the shoulder of the cartridge got all the way into the chamber. So before the bolt was locked, you're pushing the bolt forward, and the cartridge fires and the bolt comes fire comes slamming right back out the back of the action. And like I said, there was one Royal Marine who was fairly seriously injured by exactly that sort of out of battery detonation and bolt essentially blowing out the back of his rifle. Uh, this led to an immediate cessation of use of the L96s. You know, kind of an emergency thing went out of if you got one, stop shooting it, like now, because they're blowing up and we don't know why they're blowing up. And it would take AI six weeks to figure out the problem, like isolate the problem, figure out what the root cause was, and figure out a solution. Now, fortunately, the solution to this problem was relatively simple. It was make the firing pins out of the right material, which is a lot stronger, and this doesn't happen. At the same time, they also made a change to the design of the bolt. Uh, they extended the firing pin, they drilled a hole in the back of the basically the cocking piece shroud, so that now when the rifle was cocked, the back little short section of the firing pin protruded out the back of the bolt and it was visible. And it gave you a visual indicator that everything was essentially working properly. Because if you went to cock the bolt and the firing pin didn't protrude out the back, you know something's wrong. It's broken, you'd better check on what's going on. And that's actually a design feature that remains on Accuracy International Rifles to this day, and that's where it came from, was these initial out-of-battery detonations in 1986. So the result of all of this succession of, of just really terrible uh, decisions by Pylon was uh, they actually lost the contract to manufacture the L96. Uh, not before they made an attempt to squeeze AI out of business and steal the contract in its entirety from AI. Um, they were unable to pull that off and instead they ended up going bankrupt themselves. And AI was left with still having to fulfill this order of 1200 rifles for the British MOD. You know, a couple hundred of them had been sent, had been completed by Pylon, but not the whole order. And having gone through this year and a half or two years of just horrible experience with their subcontractor, AI decided that, no, screw it, we're going to raise the capital, we're going to build out our own manufacturing capacity, and whatever it takes, we're going to do this in-house under our own direction, because we understand how to make these things, and clearly these clowns did not. And that is what turned AI from three guys in a shed into a significant international uh, producer of precision rifles, which they are today. It was this building up of manufacturing infrastructure for the L96 after the gigantic pylon debacle uh, that put them in a position to really do all of their own manufacturing and then continue to expand into other military contracts and other rifles, which they have done very successfully in the decades since. So um, that is the story of First off, why L96 uh, rifles were exploding in people's faces uh, in 1986, what was done to fix it, and just some of the almost unbelievable stupid shenanigans that went on behind the scenes in manufacture, which, as I keep saying, you wouldn't think this is really a thing, but it happens way more frequently in firearms manufacture than it, you have any right to expect. So. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. My reference source for this 
Uh, all this information, by the way, if it wasn't obvious here, uh, is Steve Houghton's book L96A1 The Green Meanie. If you're interested in more uh, details about the development of, of the L96 and all of its associated um, accessories, history, and, and the rifles it developed from it, definitely check out a copy of that book. It will be out of... they only did one print run, it will be sold out sooner or later, uh, and then it will get really expensive. So anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.